my first encounter with Baldwin, I think I was like nine or 10 and I found a copy of Giovanni's Room and I read it and was not prepared to read it at nine or 10. Um, nor did I have any clue what was going on the whole time, but I was, I was hooked. I was addicted, right? Like, cause there was just, there was, uh, you know, milk and honey in, on those pages. And, um, and, and I just, you know, kept exploring and I feel like I'm always discovering something new, um, about him, about his legacy and about his work. So, um, what was your, what was your first Baldwin moment? If you can remember. Um, for me, uh, Baldwin came much later. I think I was, let's see, probably, it was been 21, 22. I was working at, I don't know, y'all know Caribou Bookstore? Yeah. Yeah, yeah shout out to Brother Yao and Simba and all the good folks. Uh, yeah, these DC people in, so I know y'all, y'all remember that, right? And how important it was to us to have black bookstore, so many black bookstores actually in the area. Um, yeah. And I used to work at the one in Alabama Mall. And I worked at the one of Ford's film all, right? That was like my first sort of real job. Not when I say real job, I mean like like real job, right? <laughs> uh, uh, while I was in school and after college. And Yao and Simba, this was at a time when like street fiction had taken over, Harry Potter had taken over. Um, and so our bookstore, although it was a black bookstore, they did sell Harry Potter because we had to make the rent, right? So it was like we wanted to sell Harry Potter. <laughs> and so what, what would happen is Yao and Simba would say, look, any kid who come in here and ask for Harry Potter, or if they ask for one of the street fiction, now, and I y'all remember street fiction, right? It was like Dutch and every thug needs a lady and all this, that, and that, right? Um, which had a place, by the way, which had a place, right? Uh, seriously, a lot of us started reading, right? It had, it had a place. But y'all and Simbo say, look, if somebody come in here and they ask you for this book and it's called, you know, every thug needs a lady or whatever, you can you give it to them. And then you said, this would be a great book to follow up with, and you suggest Baldwin, right? I had never read Baldwin, so I was like, all right, well, let me see what it is, and I'm trying to push on people. Like, if I'm swindling people, let me see what exactly the product, what the product right? Um, and so I, I pulled down the shortest one I could find because I wasn't a, a big reader, and so I tried to put down the shortest one I could find, which was The Fire Next Time. And uh, I took it home because I, they would have fired you if they caught you. It was funny, it was a bookstore, but you couldn't, like, read at work, right? Uh, so, and so, you know, like, yeah, there's work to be done, right? Restocking shelves and, you know, alphabetizing. And so, I took the book home, and I remember opening up the first page, I mean, the first story uh, essay, which was Letter to My Nephew, and read the whole thing in one sitting, and I, uh, I, it was the first time I had read something that felt like both love and rage simultaneously on the page. And I think so much of my life I was told that you can't have both, right? That you can't be like, that you can't have both love and hate you can't have both like peace and anger, right? That those two things can't coexist. And I think Baldwin showed me in that moment that that's a fallacy, um, that, that, that we can be multifaceted emotionally, um, sociologically, right? All those things can, can kind of coexist and, and share a box, right? Because in that, in that particular letter to his nephew, what he does is he, 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 he shines love on his nephew and he even shines love on the white people that he's warning his nephew about by saying these are our brothers and sisters, they just don't know they too have been bamboozled, yeah. right? And at the same time, bringing down a serious hammer of rage yeah. because he loves his nephew so much that the fear and, and, and the obligation to have to write this letter is maddening, yeah. right? And, and I think it was just, um, it was an explosive moment. I mean, like a life altering, genetically changing uh, moment for me at 21-ish years old. Yeah. Well, I love being in conversations with you, Jason, because we share a similar reading path in that a lot of the important texts that we talk about now, I did not come to it much late, you know, in my 20s, college. Um, and this is a re very refreshing uh, audience. We're just coming from the annual ALA conference. Um, and yes, yeah, no. no yeah. <laughs> Except this for the a, CSK breakfast yeah. this morning. This is a nice room. This is yeah, a nice room. yeah. <laughs> and this, this speaks to the idea of why we write for young people and how we came into reading and writing. So my, re, my writing life started uh, right at the same time that my reading life started. I, I was reading as a young person, but I was really reading in college when visiting black bookstores in New York City. You had, what was, was the name of the bookstore um, here? 
uh, Caribou, we had Inkiru, <laughs> um, which was started by Talib, rapper Talib Kweli's mother in Brooklyn. Um, we had a lot of, we had revolution books in Harlem um, and a lot, and not, now there weren't bookstores in Harlem, but there were book vendors. I don't know if you had these in DC where it was a, uh, a brother um, selling, like peddling books on the corner. Yeah, Pulling peddling cable. books on the, on the corner. Yeah. And this is where I saw Baldwin novels. That was the only place. I did not see it working at Walden Books, which was part of Borders, um, when I was in college. I saw only, I, they may have been on the shelf, but not visible. Black books were not visible until the urban fiction boom, where there was an urban fiction section. So all that to say that uh, Baldwin books were visible because of street ven street book vendors. And I can't, I can't say that I immediately gravitated towards Baldwin because at the time that I started reading, there was a plethora of books to choose from. And I didn't know where to start, but I, before I was, I had a, um, a blacky black moment in college as we all do, um, where I'm extra black. But before I was extra black, I was extra woman, like feminist. Um, so I was feminist first. So if I had to decide between Baldwin and Zora, I went for Zora. Um, and later on, finding out that Zora um, and um, Lorraine Hansberry were, you know, they were all part of that same group. But I had to read um, Go Tell It on Market, um, Go Tell It on the Mountain as part of my African-American literature course in college. And I can't say that it blew me away in the way that um, their eyes of watching God blew me away. And I want to be able to have the space to say, yes, these are important authors, but we still, we didn't have the, re the same reaction with these black books because I wasn't looking for what, at that time, I wasn't looking for whatever it is James Baldwin was saying. I was looking for, I wasn't looking for what it meant to be African American in the world. Um, but revisiting Go Tell in a Mark, um, on the Mountain a couple of years later, at that time I was looking for how to interact with my religious self mm -hmm. and my relationship with Christianity because that was a huge break for me. And what happened in that book is it was sort of an indictment of, of religious piety in African American um, community. And I'm Haitian and religious piety is also huge in the Haitian community. And at that time I was making a break, questioning my religious self and how that religious self is tied to black identity um, and whether or not it really is. So in that sense, these books come to me when I have questions about the world. And if a book can't answer a certain question, I don't connect with it immediately. So black women authors came before black male authors. And when I did um, examine black male authors, it was Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man um, in tandem with um, Malcolm, the autobiography of Malcolm X. And yeah, and needed like some hard hitting examples of black manhood to kind of compare with, you know, to kind of um, kind of balance out what I was reading about black womanhood. Yeah. So that's my, you know, it's not as hard hitting as yours, but you know, I was reading him, but not really connecting with him just yet. Yeah. Because everybody who does these kind of things, they just come and try to gas up. Baldwin right? <laughs> 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 apparently <laughs> needs our, yeah, Honestly. yeah, yeah. But I, I gotta say one more thing though, and you probably, I know there's, that's gonna come up, James Baldwin wasn't part of the conversation when I was in college. Yeah. Um, when I was in college, the big person, it wasn't even a literary figure. I remember Chava Guevara being huge part, and we wore him on our t-shirts, right? Che Guevara and um, uh, Audre Lorde yeah. in New York City. Yeah. And I'm thinking back, I'm like, when did everybody start talking about James Baldwin? Because um, he wasn't part of it. Who, who gets to decide when these literary figures become part of the national conversation? Is it other artists? Because I remember Zora was introduced by um, Alice Walker, right? And it's not until Alice Walker said, let's, you know, let's pay attention to this person we started talking about Zora. And there's a, quite a few others that 
you know, that who, who gets to decide when we start to examine these authors and they become part of the conversation? I mean, wait till we start examining Johnny Williams, break that name down. Yeah. Johnny, Johnny yeah. You'll be credited. Johnny yeah, Johnny that's you. Mark the day, mark the time, find the books. I do think there's something that happens very interestingly, like as a bookseller, when you see the publisher has just brought, like, re brought the books back out with all new covers, and you're like, oh, it's about to happen. The money is moving. The money's moving behind them. And, you know, and before then, you have to find it on a street corner. You have to find it in a used bookstore. You have to find it, you know, hopefully in your library. I'm guessing the library has always had copies of Baldwin around. <laughs> but, you know, you, uh, it, it's, a, it's a seeking thing rather as a presenting thing. And none of us here found it through our, you know, through the educational system that we came up in. No, none of us did. And I, I do, you know, I don't think that's as much the case now. I've got a herd of nieces and nephews in my life. Some of them encountered Baldwin through it. And some of them didn't. So, it's still making its way up, but um, it certainly there's a renewed popular culture interest in him, as well as an academic interest in him, as well as a an interest in him as a person of letters, and I, that's really exciting to me. You know, like to be to see like James Baldwin streetwear is just really interesting to me. Probably would have ticked him off, but like I think it's, you know, it's really interesting. But I also, you know, as happens to these people who become heroes, they also become sanitized. Um, and you talked about, Jason, the intersection of, of the rage and the love in Baldwin. Um, and we're certainly going to see in the documentary the rage, for sure. And, um, you know, it's thinking about where he belongs in a canon of writers, in a community of writers, what was happening at that moment, um, where he belongs in conversation with Zora Neale Hurston, where he belongs in conversation with Malcolm X, where, you know, it, he, once you start getting people on, on pins and on hats that conversation can get really lost. So I think a lot about when I'm hand selling Baldwin to people who have, maybe they've read the fire next time in school. I think that's often the one people encounter, or maybe they've seen Giovanni's room and they feel like they should have read it, which is always, I feel like a dangerous thing to get assigned to a book should have read that by now. Um, I worry about the joy of reading him getting taken out. I worry about the critical eye of reading him being taken out, the context being gone. Um, where do you think, you know, our responsibility as as readers of, of this fiction, of, of these writings, of this poetry, you know, is it our job to just keep giving it context, uh, to keep having the conversation? Is it, you know, publishing's job? Is it, you know, how do we prevent him from being a sanitized figure, but not turn our backs on the excitement of so many people being introduced to him? Yeah, you know, I, I think that this is always going to be the, you know, this is like the, the, the story of gentrification. Right. Okay. We don't know about that here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so good to be in Anacostia. Yeah. I, live, I live on the other side of the bridge. I live on the northeast, 15th and D. So you know that area. If you, if you, if you know the H Street area, if you're from here, H Street Northeast. Mm. So my mother grew up over there, 6 and 8, when it was, when it was burned down. Mm. Yeah, so Whole Foods on that corner. So here's the thing. I think, I think uh, in terms of context, for me at least, I don't know. I'm, care I'm careful about putting the onus on anybody other than myself. As, as a per as a human being, I just don't. I don't ever. I'm never going to be the guy who is like it's the publisher's responsibility because I because I am autonomous, yeah. right? I'm a whole person who operates within and functions within myself, right? I'm, I'm self self contained, and I have uh, I have the responsibility to make sure that when it's my turn to speak, that that I create context, right? And the one bit of context that I, I think for me going forward, as Baldwin continues to sort of become a, a pop culture. Uh, symbol which is what is happening like again, like Che yeah. became like Bob Marley became like Fela became mm -hmm. right we, when we've seen this happen over oh, people who were hated yeah. when they were living mm -hmm. uh, Muhammad Ali yeah. right Michael yeah. Max I mean, we've seen it happen over they love us when we gone right and so <laughs> uh, you know it's like it's like these people it, it, whatever right so <laughs> so I, I think for me it's just necessary to make sure that I'm Make, that I'm letting young folks know, especially because we spend most of our time around kids, yeah. um, that I'm letting young folks know uh, that I'm contextualizing him for young people yeah. and that I'm making sure that young people know that this was an agitator. This was not some, someone that was easily digestible, by the way, by anyone, yeah. Yeah. right? Not just black people, not just white people. Yeah. Black people had a hard time yeah. with James Baldwin. Yeah. He was questioning all of the black conventions that we had attributed to ourselves in terms of the way we expressed and explained our quote unquote liberation, right? It was like we had church, we had Jesus, we had this, that, and the third. And then Baldwin was like, man, I don't know, <laughs> right? I'm not so certain, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he, he challenged religion. He, he, he stood, he stood in his homosexuality at a time 
when his partners like Langston couldn't. Yeah. Right? He stood in it and said, this is who I am. He wrote about whatever he wanted to write about, which we were just saying over here, how if you write your, if your first novel is Go Tell It on the Mountain, which did okay, by the way. Like it wasn't, James Baldwin was not a star, by the way, <laughs> until much later in his life. The book, the book, the book middle, right? And then your second effort at the beginning of your career is a story about a homosexual relationship in a different country with a white protagonist at a time when you were expected, because you were a black man, to write about the black experience, black heterosexual experience. Uh, we should be applauding that, like the courage that it takes. So I want to make sure young folks and us as, as adults who continue to sort of read his work and think about his legacy, remember that James Baldwin was not palatable, right? He was, comp he was a hard read. Right, hard in the sense that he challenged all of our own conventions and the things that made us comfortable about who we were as quote unquote respectable black people at that time. He was uh, not your Negro. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> about Man, he was not your Negro. And, and furthermore, so much so, so much so, and I'm done. So much so, <laughs> so much so. This is one thing that people don't understand is how he got famous, right? And how he, how he even started his career. James Baldwin started his career by basically critiquing Richard Wright. By saying that Richard Wright's novel, and Richard Wright, by the way, was a star. Mm -hmm. And Richard went to a native son came out, which he basically was like, yo, you ain't doing nothing, but basically rewriting Uncle Tom's cabin. Yeah. You making it easy for white folks to sort of sympathize with us, but, but, but ensuring they'll never have to empathize. Mm -hmm. Right? You're making it easy, you're making it palatable and swallow and swallowable, right? And so it's my job to say, this ain't it. And so he wrote an essay called uh, Everybody's Protest Novel, where he critiqued the superstar at the time, and he was no one. And that is what sort of catapulted him into the public guy. James Baldwin wasn't, he ain't suffered no fools. He was not an easy character, and it's important that we continue to push that part of his narrative. And argued against himself. Like, you, we see his work constantly in conversation with himself, constantly critiquing himself. It's not, I, I imagine it wasn't easy to be him or to be near him sometimes. As you're saying this, I'm learning things about James Baldwin because I'm thinking about who introduced me to his work in the first place. And these were African-American uh, professors who themselves sanitate, sanitized their syllabus and their reading lists. And the books that I read as a cop, like when I went to the street, um, vendors on the street, I wasn't picking up the books that would have been on my syllabus. Um, now, a huge part of myself that I don't share a lot in my publishing world is my Pan-Africanist, up, not, not upbringing, foundations um, in understanding black writing and black authors were some of the like um, independently published books. Um, like Sheikh Anta Diop, I'm like saying this, <laughs> seeing if there, anybody nods. My favorite, yeah, my favorite novel of all time is 2000 Seasons by Aikwe Arma. I don't know, who knows this? Um, hey! <laughs> and I don't often share because it's some of these obscure books by authors who never made it into the mainstream. And at the time when I was in college, we were looking for these underground books and I have teenagers and they're looking, they, they're like, they turn up their nose at anything on the bestseller list. So, you know, no offense, <laughs> but it's, no. <laughs> hurts, hurts to hurt. <laughs> so, it's not about, right. It's not about the book. It's about this idea of looking for obscurity, looking for the thing that nobody is up on yet to find some sort of truth that belongs only to them. And that was my experience in, in college, like when James Baldwin novels existed, when Ralph Ellison and Richard Wright existed, these were all part of a canon that was probably being pushed on us. And then we were rejecting it to read Asada Shakur, um, to read uh, um, Eldred Cleaver, the, you know, the um, Black Panther Party, Novel, yeah, all of that. Um, even very problematic people like Drew Pukrum. No, um, no, um, uh, ISIS papers. When when Karibu was open, if you and y'all ever shot the Karibu in the window, it was like uh, Metuneta, okay, ISIS yeah, yeah, like yeah. The, you know. yeah, so. In that sense, we these books were not being pushed in my, and I didn't go to an HBCU. This is like a, a PWI with one African-American literature course with a syllabus that included 
one James Baldwin novel, uh, probably because he was not palatable to that particular professor. But we were pushing back against that syllabus to read Metonetter, to read some of these books that are not, that are like being, they feel like they're in the underground circuit, right? So in that sense, I'm wondering, like, because we knew even as young people that if any author, if any book makes it into the mainstream where we're talking about it and there are other people who are um, privy to whatever work this author is doing, it's already mainstream. We've already lost it. Just like we were saying earlier that Brooklyn is gone. Brooklyn is yeah. not what we know it insane and he said DC as well. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about these authors being sanitized, I think young people looking for some sort of revolutionary information mm -hmm. already know that that author is gone to us. Their work is still relevant, but we're still digging for some sort of truth that we think we're gonna be finding elsewhere. Yeah. And because we kind of discarded some of those mainstream authors, we discard their revolutionary parts too. And when you're talking about it, it's new to me because I didn't know because I was pushing back against James Baldwin, Richard Wright, um, Ralph Ellison at that time. And, uh, you know, I was actually thinking about this. I wanted to ask you guys. Um, it's fascinating to me to speak to both of you about Baldwin because you do write for the next generation of readers. Um, you, I mean, I read all of your books because I think kid lit is usually better, <laughs> meaning that it's like it's it's usually brutally honest. It's talking about stuff that adults don't want to talk about that we're uncomfortable about, which is actually what Baldwin does a lot. He talks about the things we don't want to talk about. Um, he puts it right there. Um, you know, another country like literally has the death of a brother and the whole church and the whole community has to come together to deal with whether or not to honor a person who like was not their Negro. He did not do what they like what the community asked of him. Um, you know, they just re-released actually Little Man, Little Man, well, which is Baldwin's, they called it at the time, an experimental children's book. Um, for daring to have pictures? I don't know. Like, I still like, I'm like, why was this experiment? It's so silly. Yeah, his experimental children's book. It's beautifully illustrated, beautifully illustrated. And it's a, you know, about a child basically being raised by their community in, in this moment. You know, it's the, it's truly is the, the whole community is raising this kid. It's a day in the life. It's a, it's a Ulysses story. <laughs> nothing happens. Like nothing happens in this book. Um, kid wanders around all day. Um, but it, it's, it's what happens. Like I recognized myself. I was like, yeah, I just wandered around. You go, you go to the store. Someone, t someone takes care of you, kicks you out when you get annoying. You, you go over here, you get yelled at by three different aunties. Like it's like, this is what happens. Um, you know, having that re-released and watching it ping around in bookstores in different sections as people try to figure out, they're like, it's James Baldwin, but it's for kids. It's like but it's like 50 pages <laughs> and this like hardcover and there's so much type on every page, you know. Uh, and like we don't. And I was like, yeah, it's kind of a fun reminder that we don't know what to do with him. <laughs> um, but like, you know, thinking about does, you know, has the conversation around Baldwin influenced your work at all? Do you see young people grappling with him? Should they, you know? I don't think there's ever like a right time for a book to necessarily enter a kid's life as far as like age, but more like what that kid's going through. Um, but I'm just curious, like, do you see him at all involved in the conversation of children's literature? Um, you know, and it's so, it is the conversation in children's literature radically different than when Baldwin was writing his, his kid's book. In terms of, of his work and its influence, I think that it's easy for us to look at Baldwin's, his, his work as, as, um, as Protestant. I mean, as, as an, as in protest uh, and right, uh, but there are other parts of his life and his work that aren't that are really talked about. If you read something like you know nobody knows my name, you know in the intro in the first the first part of that book, and right toward the end of that that that, that opening piece, um, he says my favorite quote, which I it's like a mantra of mine. I, I, I say, say it every day, which basically is, um, the internal life is the real life, right, and that the dreams of people have a tangible effect on the world, right? That's, that, that also is James Baldwin. He said that too. And you never hear about that side of James Baldwin who literally was telling the world, the best part of you is the part of you that is, on the, is, that is, that is internal and intrinsic and that that is real. Mm -hmm. And don't let anybody tell you that, that, that those things, that, that, that piece of you isn't real. And that the dreams you have literally shift the earth. Right? Imagine if kids knew that, right? And I think we try to say that. I think that's what we want to do. But that is a very, that, that, that was James Baldwin at the height of his career saying those things. Now, on the other side of the coin, I think there are some bold statements that I wish we, uh, and, and honestly, I think Evie makes some bold statements to be, to be completely 
I, I, I really like to sit next to Evie in situations like this because I think that people should know that she's a very, she's a courageous writer and there, there aren't a lot of us. And that is the truth because we, because when you're a black person, when you're a black person in this industry, you're trying to figure out how you're going to keep food on the table. You're trying to figure out, you still think they're doing you favors and you're scared of losing your opportunity. So taking those big swings get a little complicated. And I like to make sure that we that we pay homage to the people who are willing to do that the best they can. I think he's one of those people. Um, I think Baldwin. I think I think about the bravery in going to meet the man. Does anybody know this? Because this is also not a not one of the popular ones. Yeah. Going to meet the man. If you go and read it, it is wild because the entire story is a dream sequence, right? It's basically like a man and for, and for the young people, you know. You here? Your parents brought you here, so this is what's happening. But it's basically, about, I mean, you know, in the library, this is, this is a space for open minds. Yeah, it's it's basically a story that starts off with a man laying in bed with his wife and he can't get aroused. A white man laying in bed with his white wife and he can't get aroused. Right. So he starts to daydream what it would be like to be with a black woman. And then, his, and his daydreams then spin into a series, a dream sequence of every horrible thing that happens to black people. Right? Lynchings, everything. And when he comes out of the dream sequence, he's aroused. And he then tells his wife that he'd like her to pretend that he's a black man. When, when, when we talk about making bold moves, there, is not, there are moments in my life and in my work, when I was writing All American Boys, where, I, where Brendan and I wanted to figure out how do we type it, tap into the idea of the white imagination and how dangerous it can be. Baldwin was doing that then, and it wasn't being talked about. Exactly. Exactly. I think we. Nope. I really believe that we're still uncovering a lot of the things that he really was doing at a time when it was a faux pas. Uh, and so I try to make sure. For so me personally, I try to be as bold as I as I can. I, you know, without 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 dehumanizing children. Right. It's no good. It's, it, it makes no sense for me to swing for the fence if the children in my book suddenly just become symbols of my swinging. Right? I still got to tell stories about old people. Um, but I like to make sure that I, when I think about Baldwin, I think about a man who wasn't afraid um, and who took big swings as often as possible if it meant serving the people that he wanted to read these books. Wow. You know, um, I love this conversation, Jason, because he's coming with a whole wealth of this um, knowledge um, and prior knowledge about Baldwin. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, I didn't. And that speaks to why we didn't know that James Baldwin wasn't doing these things. Yeah. And I was, and this speaks to this idea of why me as a young reader was pushing back against mainstream, looking for those things. I didn't find it there, but I was looking for that sort of hard truth, the people who were courageous in their writing. And at that time, James Baldwin was part of the canon. He was, I think maybe his work was part of like um, Henry Louis Gates' Norton Anthology of African-American Literature or whatever. Um, but looking for the, the, I think one of the first boldest um, pieces of writing that I came across was The D Dutchman by Leroy Jones, um, who later became Amar Amiri Baraka that I discovered on my own. Um, and if I had looked a little deeper, I would have found that because that's what I was looking for. Now, in terms of speaking of what we do as authors, it's like we want, we write, we spend some, so much time writing alone. Um, I'm reminded of this, um, the song, the Stevie Wonder song called Some Years Ago. And part of the lyrics is, that was some years ago when we had more hope than money. Um, right now, children's literature, they're looking for diverse voices as they should. They're looking for diverse range of black stories as they should. So there's a lot of recognition that can come with that. And at the same time, we have to decide whether not just feet, how to put food on the table, but do we get recognition for our work? And when we're expecting that recognition, how is it that we're writing the stories that would garner whether or not, what decisions do we make on whether or not we write the stories that would garner those sort of sorts of recognition. Mm -hmm. And at the time when James Baldwin and others like him were writing, I don't know if they were looking for the money on the table, right? The, I don't think they were looking for those national book awards or what have you, because so much was at stake at the time. Yeah. And it was because so much was at stake, they were looking to tell a certain 
kind of truth. And if any sort of recognition came from that, it was just the way the cookie crumbled. Mm -hmm. So right now for me, it's making the decision of like, you know what, I cannot care about this. I have to say, uh, I have to tell a hard hitting truth that will feed my creative soul and kind of deal with the consequences later, mm -hmm. um, right? And thinking about who are the others doing the same and wanting to be in conversation with them. So, and you know, and you are one of those people, definitely, Jason, um, where it's it's boring if we don't push the envelope mm -hmm. because this is at stake. You know, for me to walk in here and be like, oh, this is refreshing. Um, <laughs> that's something that is at stake. And I think I don't want to be complacent in after getting some sort of recognition. I don't want to feel like I've arrived. I can take a break because I, I still have not tell, told a certain kind of truth. I'm thinking about, yes, uh, yes, that was good. <laughs> this is a very nourishing conversation and a very challenging conversation. I think, I feel like a part of what's at stake is the individual identity of your characters, of your readers, of you as authors, um, I think there's a fight for individuality when you're being marketed as a diverse voice. I think there's a, a fight for individuality when you are trying to write a story that is that in that story. It is that story. It's that moment. That's the truth you're writing. Um, but then it gets handed to uh, everyone as everybody's truth, as everybody's story. And I, you know, every single Baldwin book is different from the other Baldwin book and might be contradictory to the last Baldwin book. Every essay, um, I'm trying to work my way and find all of his essays right now. And they are, it's a cacophony of, of, of truths <laughs> and moments. Um, and I, I worry, you know, I think a lot about um, the rage that he boldly showed, the love that he boldly showed, um, the questioning, the fact that he, you know, you were speaking about Giovanni's room, just the <laughs> insanity of writing that book to begin with, let alone publishing it. Um, I'm glad it was published at all um, and to be celebrated, you know, the way it is. But it is, you know, it's one moment, it's one truth, it's one story. And there's a complexity of character that he chose to show at a time when you were supposed to be one thing. You were supposed to be one kind of person. You were supposed to represent the race. Not that that's as if that's gone away, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, you know, the what a black writer was, what a black male writer was, um, he refused to perform that. Um, and there are some moments in his career where you see him sort of performing that. And it's really interesting. And I, I don't entirely know why. There was a, a clip that went around actually right around the time um, uh, I was lucky enough to have this conversation a few months ago of him, uh, James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni having, having a fantastic argument, a spicy argument. It was, it was so just watching those two minds spar was so good. These are two queer writers having a conversation about like a heteronormative fictional marriage they might be having. <laughs> and like, you treat me this way when you come home. And I was just like, I have what? <laughs> What's happening? What are and, you know? Who are they performing this for? They're both way too smart to not know. They're not performing. What's going on? Um, and I th I think that that happens a lot. Like he he claims territory that we don't expect him to have the right to claim. Um, claims it for himself. Claims it for us so other people can follow. Um, but I I think when we talk about like oh this is questioning. He's questioning this. He's challenging this. He just gave himself permission to be a person and to be an individual person. Um, and I think that as a legacy, the more I'm reading, the more I'm thinking about this as the National Book Foundation's, you know, t taking a year to celebrate this person. It's giving me the time and space to actually look at him as a whole person, as a whole project. Um, and it is, it's a really great gift to have, you know, this father, this grandfather of, of letters who demanded space for himself to do these things and to say that this is what you can do. You have permission to do this. Um, do you think that as we get more recognition from, you know, whether you call it mainstream, white, what, you know, it's all becoming complicated, you know, we're, we're breaking in, but at the same time, there's still this call to, to simplify yourself, 
to simplify yourself. Do you guys we feel do. that? Yeah. Do you feel this call, this push? Do you feel able? Do you feel the power to push back? Does Baldwin help with that? Does it even occur to you? Who else helps you with that if it's not Baldwin? I think we're, we, the way you sp spoke about Baldwin just now, we're given that sort of recognition in hindsight. Mm. Um, it's not in the, while in the process of making art. Yeah. Um, for example, I was born in Haiti. I'm Haitian American, but I'm writing, my next few books are about the African American experience. And I'm thinking maybe I'll get pushed back or not, right? And I realize that it won't be for, and I think we spoke about this, it won't be after uh, someone's, any artist's body of work that we look back and say, oh, this is what they were doing, mm -hmm. or this is what they were trying to do. Or, you know, now it's like they're all over the place, we can't follow them, or we basically ignore them, right? You know, he, like you said, he, nobody knew who he was. We ignore these artists as they're trying to figure themselves out. And it's not until it's too late, you know, or posthumously that we're like, oh, wow, they were brilliant. Yeah. Um, and I said, if someone asked me, what's your goal, right? And I'll say this. I said, I want to, I want to get the McCarthy Genius Award, right? Not, hell not yeah. I, <laughs> I'm going to get the McCarthy Genius Award. Right. Not to say that it'll happen, but I like that award because when they announce these winners, it's like, it's, it's people that somebody, sometimes we don't, never heard of them. Yeah. Never heard of them, right? They're in some lab or corner working on their craft and art and science in obscurity, right? Somebody saw them, somebody recognized them and then they're rewarded. You know, we celebrate and they go back into their little corner. And to me, sometimes that's how genius works, where they're examining who they are as human beings. And like you said, their work, their science, their research may be contradictory, right? So that's the part that I want to be as an author where it's my artist self, my scientific self, rather than my performative self. Because mm -hmm. I don't think James Baldwin was performing. Yeah. He was not performing. And I feel like in this day and age as artists with social media, we're asked to perform a lot, yeah. or we think we have to perform, or we're forced to perform. Uh, in terms of just being made small as but you were saying how like you know now that we're sort of matriculating through this through this mainstream system and you know, this that, and that well i mean first thing is like we we always been mainstream yes. you know what i mean like we've been mainstream forever we we i think we like to believe I, look i think that the, 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 if we were to look at the numbers the numbers are clearly skewed in terms of the mainstream the, the, the demographic the way the pie chart splits right but there's all there's never been a time in american history where blackness ain't been mainstream Right, like especially in the arts, yeah, ever. Right, I mean, and I hope you all know that, like mm -hmm. ever. Which is why the conversation in the literary industry about marketing uh, is so silly, mm -hmm. right? Because you history say silly again, because it is silly. It's, it's silly, <laughs> it's right? Silly. Like I, 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 I've been in the industry since two thousand five. Um, had my bumps and bruises, ups and downs. When I came back in the industry in two thousand thirteen, um, we were pitching a book called "When I Was the Greatest," and no publisher wanted to take it. Uh, Walter D. Myers had had a 40 year career and he had written over 150 books about, in the exact tradition in which I was coming through, right? He was my mentor and they said, we don't have a market for it, yeah. right? <laughs> Who's going to read and, these it's books? It's fascinating. Nobody wanted to touch the book. And the fascinating part about it is that I always say, like, it's weird that you all can't figure out how to, that you all can't see that there's a market for it when every single black art form that's ever existed has always yeah. been, has always become mainstream yeah. and then taken. Um, yeah. Right, like that is that is the way it, it has worked historically. Uh, so in terms of me feeling small now that we have arrived, I, at the end of the day, I, I, I at first I preface this by saying one, I'm a man. Uh, men are treated differently in this industry, uh, and that should be said. Right, I have that privilege. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it, it is what it is. That is the truth. Two, I'm a large man. Mm -hmm. uh, large people, specifically large men, are treated differently in this industry. Yep. Um, and three, I've been fortunate enough uh, to have whatever success that I have at this particular juncture. If I'm being completely honest, at this particular juncture, do I ever feel like I'm going to be made to feel small about something that I want to make? The honest answer is no. And the truth is, is because I recognize that this is not a humanitarian organization. This is not a, phil a philanthropic community. This is business. Yeah. And all they care about is bottom line. And the bottom line has been protected 
by my intellectual <laughs> property. That is a truth, yeah. right? That I don't want to pretend, yeah. right? And until that bottom line begins to get a little foggy, until it begins to perforate, I will, ne- they will, I will never be challenged. Mm-hmm. And that is on record and on camera, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> that, that, like that is the truth. Absolutely. Like that, that is the truth. And I, I just don't want to pretend about it, yeah. um, which means then that I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to make sure that I'm pulling folks up. I have a responsibility to make sure that I'm shouting out black women and brown women, making sure that we that, that they're getting fair swings. I have a responsibility to talk about money and making sure that we got fair, fair, you know, fair, fair money across the table. I have a responsibility. Like th- these are the things yeah. that like I have to make sure if I have been, if I have been for whatever reason given this opportunity, you gotta make sure, at least for me, I'm a me, we kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Right? We gotta make sure that we that we do what we can mm-hmm. to um to level the playing field. Yeah. I'm proud of Evie's boy. I'm proud of Elizabeth Acevedo. I'm proud, like I'm proud of of of, of the rest of us who are now coming in because there are more than there have ever been yeah. and, and we shine and despite the down pressure. And there will always be a down pressure. Um, but we've never been broken before and won't be broken now. I ain't worried about it. Yeah. I'm just gonna make my work and keep it pushing. Yes. Okay, we're gonna take a moment. Bask. I think that it is, uh, there's a, a boldness in, cl- in declaring and y- you start out the conversation and my actual first question that I thought about when thinking about Baldwin's work in conversation with this documentary, which is from a very specific moment in Baldwin's life and a horrible, uh, not unexpected, but horrible series of tragedies in America had occurred to people that he loved and were his brothers and sisters in the fight and they were gone and he was pissed (laughs) and the 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 presentation of the documentary is a little bit as if this is how Baldwin was like he woke up in the morning and went to war like it was like had my had my coffee (laughs) I'm ready to fight the white man like it was like which was probably it's sort of true but in a different way perhaps than is presented in the documentary um the documentary is not it's not it's not false it, it, and it's a great piece of work, but it is certainly a perspective of a very complex person. Um, and he, uh, as an individual, as somebody who recognized the gifts that he had to offer, recognized just as you both do, had goals, career goals for himself, had goals for where he wanted to see his people, had goals for living his own unique life. Um, I don't see all of that necessarily in this documentary. Um, And I think it's important to talk about that. I think it's important to acknowledge that so many people were introduced to to Baldwin through this documentary, and that's awesome. And so many people were introduced to the um, moments of loss, those deep moments of loss that brought about the man you see on the screen here. Um, But also, there is so much love in Baldwin. There's so much love for for uh, the oppressor, for his brothers and sisters, for the people who don't understand his work, (laughs) for himself. I think he did love himself, and that's a testament. I mean, (laughs) though he loved himself, (laughs) thought he was great. (laughs) There's a lot of people who think they're great who don't love themselves, you know, and I I think, um, I, I hope that if anything you leave today curious about the complexity um, uh, of him and um, but I wanted to kind of think about that juxtaposition of rage and love and the, the, the permission he gives himself in, in his work in different ways that rage and love um, and that it's, it's necessary and I think it, co- it coexists in all of us and we have to give it sp- the space um, when you, yeah he was like the bridge <laughs> I, 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 I'm sure people in here know a lot about his life you know, the one thing that I think we also never talk about when it comes to James Baldwin is that he actually was the conduit. Like he was the bridge between every single faction of black of black um, movement yes. at the time. He yeah. was the glue for every single faction. Had 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 they all lived, yeah, he would have been the. He was the. He was the point of access and the point of access for all of them to sit down. So like the way that that the movie even starts, right? It's like Malcolm, Martin, and Mecca, right? Yeah. And how these are his friends. Yes. All three of them yeah. were his friends. All three of those people. They were his friends. Not like we were at the same party. They were his his friends. friends. They were his friends. He could have brought, he he literally could have unified all of black America and all of its different factions at the time in terms of movement was concerned, which is an incredible thing to think about. I want to point out that Raul Peck um, produced and directed 
Shout and he out is a uh, Haitian American filmmaker. Get you yeah. shout out to Haitian yeah. folks. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that point of, and I just want to say, uh, talk about the impact of African American activists and scholars and in, uh, public intellectuals, the impact that they had on non-American black nations like Haiti. Um, of course, Raul Pack knew about James Baldwin's work and therefore the intellectuals in Haiti, um, pre Duvalier, which was a dictator, you had your intellectuals who studied these, um, in, uh, who studied these thinkers, mainly because of France Fernand um, being a uh, Francophone intellectual, Wretched of the Earth, translated into French. Some of these books, I'm not sure which ones were translated into French, um, but at the same time, these people left Haiti and became part of the movement. One of my, um, one of my spiritual mothers um, was a former Black Panther um, Party member who was Haitian and goes back to Haiti and does the work. And I always like to think, um, say that even if we improve race relations in this country, right, we take 10 steps forward, uh, places like Haiti, uh, third world countries, developing Black nations take 10 steps backwards. And what the, the documentary lets my children know that this conversation is still happening. What does it mean that we're, this is, this is, what does it mean that his words are still relevant? His rage is yeah. still relevant. Yeah. What does that mean yeah. about the status quo and what we're doing to change the status quo? Why does quo? this black and white film sound, could have been recorded yesterday? Right. Yeah. Yeah, the when reading the fire, uh, the fire this time, I, it's like my go-to nonfiction book club read. Always, I'm always like, "Have we? Have you read this yet?" Okay, that's what we're gonna read. Um, and and everybody comes back like shell shocked, especially if they're white, and they're like, "What is this now?" I'm like, "Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. This is this is now. It's then. It's now. Hopefully, it's not always. Let's talk about it." Um, but yeah, it it is a uh, it. And it's part of you want to say part of it is is his is his talent for um, universality through individuality, right? But also that not a lot has changed around the world and and in the day to day in the way that we we want to pretend that it has to comfort ourselves. And here's the thing about my own personal life and understanding: um, as an author, I'm thinking about the commodification of black intellectual thought of black art as a conversation I've had to have with the my editors and agents believe it or not a very hard conversation um, and how we can always talk about what needs to change because it you can sell that as a product within a book or a documentary but I know just from my communities in Brooklyn that there is change happening on the underground communities. I think the only thing I could relate to in DC is go-go music and the culture around um, African cultural retentions like go-go music. Um, if we talk about African American music, we are talking about African cultural retentions and all the culture around preserving those traditions outside of the white gaze that cannot be commodified. So James Baldwin was important, his books were important, but what's also important is the communities that have not necessarily read James Baldwin, who live what he, we already live what he says we need to aspire to. Uh, the nine to five worker, the, ser you know, the service workers who come back home and preserve black culture in big and small ways. And I remember your, your fish eating, your fish, your mama's in your, your mama and you, I'm fascinated by how Jason eats fish. Um, snapper, red snapper, like off the bone, like, I don't know. Yeah, that I was, when I saw that, like it, it was a big piece of snapper. I turned around and it was just the, the you know, the, the vertebrae, whatever it is, and the head. And I was like, that's real African, Jason. That is some, that is something that like came across the, Middle Passage, and you did not forget yeah. how to eat. <laughs> right. You know what? It's interesting, though, right? Because because if Baldwin were alive, because Baldwin said that, mm -hmm. right? So when Baldwin talks about sort of the moment that he realized that he had basically been writing from a place of fear and arrogance, and therefore fallacy, because he was writing about the American South and had never been, 
Yeah. Right? He was writing about Jim Crow and writing about all your know, black codes and had never had never left New York City. And then goes to Mississippi and is like, oh, I thought it was this. Turns out it's 10 times worse. And yet these people move on. And yet these people stand up, right? It's like he literally, he literally said, he's like, oh, like, here we are thinking, I, here I am thinking that I am so intelligent and so articulate and, and able to sort of comprehend, synthesize, and then redisseminate information in a way that will make my people feel proud. And it turns out I've literally been hitting wiffle balls the whole time. Like, at some point, we really got to figure out, he got, we got to give him, he got like, like a monument or something. Like, he really figured out, like, every, when you look at his life now, he, because he would literally agree, he'd be like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. that, that's what he would, I mean, that's what he did say, and if he were here today, what he, what I would imagine, he would say, I mean, to the point that he even realized that he was not a marcher. Yeah. And that he had so much respect for the people who were out in the street being hosed, right. and the people in the street with guns. And the people, right? He, he had some with, with the deacons and all the people who were willing to go out there because he didn't have it in him to do it. So he decided, well, I do have a role, yeah. and I'm going to play my part. But my part, I, I don't have the backbone that they have, mm -hmm. and was able to admit to admit that, right? Mm -hmm. To be so evolved, I feel like we just, I feel like, are we, I feel like we ain't doing enough, right? Mm -hmm. Well, some of us are. Oh, you're right, because there are because those people who are marching back then are still marching. Yeah, and still fighting and yeah, building right. community and providing food. Yeah. And, right. and here we are, Anacostia. Anacostia in this city, as y'all know, everybody think they know Ward 8. Yeah. And most of the folks who think they know Ward 8 ain't never stepped foot in Ward 8 <laughs> to see what's actually happening. You know, like this community is that community, you know? Yeah, I was in Trinidad, which is Noma now, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Noma. Oh, uh, north of Massachusetts, it's developer speak for for. A yeah, it was a uh, Trinidad. Was a, sorry, Tr Avenue, Avenue, <laughs> Avenue. I'm sorry, Caribbean. you're okay. you're Caribbean. You're like you are Trinidad. Yeah. Sorry, hyper hyper local <laughs> moment. Hyper local <laughs> moment. <laughs> yeah, and then you know now there's you know now it's you know H Street Corridor and Noma, and I was like, what happened? What happened? <laughs> and you know, and we're watching it, but watching the people who were there, but I didn't know about Anac I didn't know. I'm from I'm from here, and I didn't know Anacostia. We can speak to this idea intellectually. Yeah. We know what gentrification is yeah. intellectually, but there is no lens, there is no national lens on the people who actually get pushed out. Yeah. The people that we know who have to pack up all their stuff and look for other places to live, right? On a Saturday and Monday, they gotta take the bus from West Bubble, boop, you know, back to their work because they've been displaced, right? We're writing about it, we can speak to the idea intellectually, but they gotta move on. They have to move on. There's a, co a collection, speaking of uh, Baldwin's grandchildren, there's a collection by Camille Acker um, called Training School for Negro Girls, which is, it's such a great collection. And it's really dealing with right now but it's also dealing with right then. And it's a it's a really nice, I was thinking about Bridges, like it's a really nice a nice book about that. But I think about um, all, all, all of the multitudes Baldwin contains, all of the multitudes we all contain and all the stories the city contains and, and Black America contains and it just spirals out almost. But I think his ability was to zero in on a character, on an individuality and let them live their life because they're gonna have to get on that bus, right? Um, and give them their, that dignity. Like every every single character has dignity without being performatively perfect. Um, and that's really important. And I think another thing we don't talk about, we gotta switch to Q and A soon, but I think one of the important things we don't talk, we don't talk enough about is um, we're like how bold and how incredible that he wrote Giovanni's Room and that he was gay. But you know, blackness and gayness, now we still still struggle with it and he's, just he's been ever, and he's just he just was uncom uncom uncompromisingly that um you know a uh, black queer woman it i look to his work all the time for that strength and i don't uh i don't think we like you know we in the industry or in the, in the the letters industry in academia even we don't talk about it very much somehow we're like how bold how great and then we like move on to the next point of conversation because we still aren't comfortable grappling with it um you know how have you encountered that do you hear people talking about about his sexuality how much should it be part of the conversation um i think you know he spoke it he he wrote these books he included it 
we didn't compromise about it, but I still don't think we really talk about it that much. I think that was the major critique with the documentary, yeah. that it didn't examine um, Baldwin's gayness, uh, sexuality at all. Yeah. Um, and it's, and I'm, and when I talk about like the books that I read in college, it was part of the zeitgeist of this super masculine revolutionary, yeah. Yeah. which is why Baldwin was pushed to the back yeah. and um, Invisible Man was at the forefront. Yeah, um, okay. uh, yeah all of those yeah. Uber. And yeah. I got, and I didn't mention this before, but a lot of those books were introduced to me by the, by the boyfriends I had. Mm -hmm. um, and I always knew black men, young black men were reading because they were there in the barbershops in the street corner talking about, yo, you got to read this. Yo, yo, yo. You know, it was part conspiracy theorizing was part of black male youth culture Maybe. because, yeah, <laughs> is. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, there'd be that one brother who come, you know, come out of jail and they read all these books and you got to be up on this. So in that sense, that um, hyper masculinity, the misogyny in black revolutionary thought or any intellectual intellect misogyny and intellectualism hood intellectualism went hand in hand so in that sense we love the rage right we love the love we love the rage even more but the sexuality we have not been able to discuss even now with even the three women who are the founders of the black um lives matter movement yeah. right we love we love the activism, but we still haven't grappled with what does it mean to love us, right? To be revolutionary and to be queer. Yeah. And it's something that's still new to me, even at my age, because it wasn't part of the conversation coming up. I mean, one of the most revolutionary people in our entire, in, in entire black history, in terms of all the movements, is Byron Rustin. And Byron Rustin never got a moment to shine, even though he was the mastermind behind most of the civil rights movement right. because yeah. he was an openly gay man. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think this is something that the black community is still struggling with. And I, uh, at, at the end of the day, the thing that saved us is the very thing that imprisoned us. And that's just the reality, whether we like to admit it or not. I think that at some point, I think Baldwin pushing against piety was a, was a, was a powerful thing because what he was really doing was propping the door open for him to then express who he actually was. If he could deconstruct the thing that saved us, then he could say, hey, it did do this thing for us, but it also imprisoned us in other ways. And now that I've gotten you here, let me let you know that here's my moment of freedom. And if you don't decide to follow up, well, that's on you, but I have to live my truth, right? By arresting lived his truth, he was punished for it, but he was never afraid to live it. And I think if there's anything to take from it, because it's, it's, nice, it's still not being talked about, but if there's anything to take from it, it's that. And furthermore, I think that, I think that when it comes to black women writers, mm -hmm. I actually think, you know, in a similar case, you know, we, thankfully we had our hero, yeah. right? To be bold about like, this is who I am and, and this is how I live. Um, and, and I love blackness mm -hmm. and, and I love women. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can't rock with it, you lose. Yeah. And I'm going to love you through that loss, but you're going to lose regardless. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's much to be said. I'd love to see somebody do some sort of essays where they compared those two. Mm -hmm. um, not compared, but where they connected those two, Baldwin yeah. and Lowe, because they're so similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They put those two in conversation because they're so similar. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go next to Hughes. We never got to connect. Yeah. Um, this for you, too. Thank you.